Hey everyone, just this uh, video is going to be on, on capacitors. It's going to be quite a quick one hopefully. This is obviously for people doing my electronics course, so people on the internet who are on my channel, I'm really sorry if this doesn't cover everything you need to know, but please stop asking me questions because I designed this for my students and not for randoms, but anyway, if it helps you, great. So capacitors, these little things that you guys will have used on the course, they are um, well, we'll learn what they are, but this is basically what the exam board AQA says you need to know about them. So understand they store charge, understand what po polarised and non-polarised is, and the use of the units of measurement correctly. Um, spot the anode and cathode on a polarised capacitor, use one with a resistor to make a time delay, and understand how they can be used to smooth a DC voltage. Some of that sounds fairly straightforward. Uh, some of it sounds a little bit nerdy and hard to understand, but do not fear, I'll talk you through it very quickly. So, what you need to know about capacitors then? They're really simple. Uh, they're a device that stores charge. So, as I've said there, charge is energy that is not flowing. So, we, we've talked about this before, if you liken electricity to water, um, if water is flowing in, in a river, it, it has a current, it's flowing with a current. However, if water is in a lake, it's not flowing. Um, it's the same with electricity. So if it's flowing, it's a current. If it's stored, uh, it's a charge. And capacitors can do this. They can store a charge um, at a potential that can be released later. Uh, they're not Probably the easiest way to think of them is as, as being like little um, rechargeable batteries, like tiny, tiny ones, okay? If that helps simplify it. So these are the two things they can use, be used for. Um, the most important one is this one I put in bold here, time. Um, people tend to skip over this a little bit, but these are the only components in analog electronics, or old school electronics as I like to call it, that actually make a time delay. And this is a bit hard for people to come to grips with. They are the only component that in electronics that doesn't work at the speed of light. Um, pretty much anything in electronics generally works at the speed of electricity, which is pretty much the speed of light. Whereas um, capacitors actually take time to do their thing. They physically take time to fill up. If you think of a capacitor as being like a bucket uh, with water, that bucket of water would take an amount of time to fill up. And the amount of time that bucket of water would take to fill up would be based on how big the bucket is and how much pressure was coming out of the hose pipe. So, it's the same with capacitors. If they're bigger, they take longer to fill up. If you put something in the way of the current flowing into them, like a resistor, for instance, that also affects how long they take to fill up. So, that fact they cause a time delay is really useful. It's the only thing we've got for getting a time delay in electronics. They're used in 555 time circuits um, and all sorts of other things. So we use them for time, or making time, and we also use them for smoothing fluctuating voltages, which I'll show you in a totally different circuit. It'll make it a bit easier to understand. Uh, they're measured in this unit called farads. I think it's named after some bloke that discovered them. The thing to talk about with farads is basically when the bloke, um, you know, I don't know enough about my history here, but when he invented capacitance or discovered it or whatever it is he did, uh, there wasn't really a use for capacitors at the time because electronics wasn't developed enough. So the unit of measurement he made for uh, capacitors was was bloody massive. It was huge. It was a bit. It would be a bit like us measuring distances, like we would do on a table with a ruler, but using miles as our default unit of measurement rather than millimeters. Um, sorry, I'm from the UK, so we use a mix of metric and imperial for anyone who's getting a bit confused, but it'd be like using kilometres uh, rather than millimetres for measuring things with a ruler. It's absurd. It's a massive unit. Um, a one farad capacitor would be huge, massive. Uh, you wouldn't really be able to pick the thing up. So, as a result, when uh, they actually started using capacitors in real electronics, they discovered that they didn't actually need very big ones. They were, compared to a farad, they were really, really tiny. And what this means, unfortunately, for you guys doing GCSE, is that you've got a pain in the backside trying to convert them. Um, real capacitors come in tiny, tiny uh, values, micro, nano, or pico farads. If you know anything about standard form, these are very, very tiny numbers. Okay, uh, we'll we'll come back to that in a second. But what it means is, any time you do the maths with capacitors, you have to convert 
uh, the value from its normal form here, micro, nano or pico, if your maths is going to make sense and give you the right answer. Anyway, I'm talking a lot about this. So let's quickly uh, go on to this. Types and identification. This is what the spec says you need to know. See, I'm not lying. Identify polarized, non polarized. There we go. Um, two main types non polarized, electrolytic. Uh, they do the same job, they, they both still store charge. However, the, they look different and they are connected to a circuit differently. So the electrolytic type, that's this type down on the bottom right. They, um, because of the way they're constructed, they are basically made up of um, like a conductor foil and an insulator, like a plastic or paper, wrapped around, laid together and then wrapped around into a cylinder. Um, because of that, for some reason, with to do with physics, I'm not that up on it, um, it matters which way around in a circuit they're connected. So they have an anode and a cathode, a positive and a negative. Two ways to tell uh, which leg is which. Like an LED, the long leg is always the anode, the positive, and the short leg is the cathode. If you physically look at them, they have a stripe down the side with a little minus for negative symbol printed on them. So that's the other way you can spot the cathode if some deviant has been along and cut both the legs to the same length, as seems to happen in some of my lessons. You've also got the other type, non-polarized. Uh, they come in a variety of different technologies. You've got ceramic, polyester, tantalum bead. There's all, all different uh, types of material that's used to make them. But basically, because of their construction, they don't have any polarity. They can be connected either way around in a circuit, and it won't cause any problems. Generally, what you find is that smaller value capacitors tend to be this type, the non-polarized. And bigger value capacitors, I say bigger, I mean relatively, um, are the electrolytic type that look like this and you can get these in two different forms you can get an axial like this or radial it depends whether it's got two legs on one side or a leg on either side but they, they all do the same job they store charge or they store electricity okay so time delays this is the the main thing they're used for and the, and the thing you're most likely to get asked on the exam in the exam they might do this, they might quiz you and say what is this called, label the anode and the cathode and they'll give you a couple of marks but if they're going to give you a bunch of marks, say five or six, they'll be asking you a question about time delays. So best to jump to a circuit for this, uh, we'll come back to that in a second. Right, here's a circuit I've got, for those in my classes I'll have shown you this in the lesson. Um, I'm just going to um, stop, press play again, here we go. Right, if you look at it, you'll recognize a lot of this stuff. We've got a battery, we've got a SPST switch, a resistor, an electrolytic capacitor. Um, by the way, I didn't really cover this, but this is the symbol for them. The electrolytic looks like that, and the non-electrolytic, if I can find it, if I can, looks exactly the same, it just doesn't have a plus symbol. Okay. And we've got a transistor, which if you remember from my other videos, behaves like a kind of electronic gateway or an electronic switch, a resistor and an LED. And I'll just press play on this time delay to show you what it does. Uh, press play on this circuit to show you what it does. There you go. Nothing happens at all. I click the switch. A couple of seconds delay. And then the light comes on. Doesn't seem very impressive, does it? Um, I click the switch about a second's delay and then the light goes off. Now, that's all very well and interesting, so what, we've made a light that comes on after a fraction of time with a delay. That's very useful. Um, it can be, it's used in all sorts of everyday electronics, so in a car, on the interior lighting, normally when you open the door, which could be detected by this switch, you get the light come on and fade up, and also when you close the door, um, normally there's a few seconds delay before the interior light turns itself off. It makes the car look a little bit uh, more professional and it's a bit kinder on your eyes as well. So that's why they do it. Uh, you could use this on any other sorts of things. So on, um, I think like on Aldis and things, they have headlights that even when you turn the engine off, the headlights stay on for sort of 10, 20 seconds to illuminate uh, your driveway so you can walk home without get, getting mugged or something. Um, but yeah, used in all sorts of things, and we got to understand how it works. So the way it works is as follows. When we, uh, when we press this switch here, what we do is we send electricity has the ability to flow out of the battery, and it can flow two ways, but only one way 
to start with. All right, it wants to flow this way, but it can't actually get past this point because this is a transistor, and as I've spoken to you guys before, it's a bit like a switch that conducts from here, its collector, to here, its emitter, whenever it gets a signal here on its base. But we haven't sent a signal to the base yet, so nothing can flow this way. So no energy can flow there. Instead, it flows down its other path. It goes through this resistor, and it goes into filling up this capacitor. Now what happens is, as that capacitor is filling, all of the um, all of the voltage, if you like, in the circuit is not going into, but is basically used in in filling this capacitor up. And as a result, there is virtually no voltage coming through here to trigger our transistor. Think of it as like filling up a, a rechargeable battery. When the battery is flat, the voltage across it will start off really high, and as the capacitor starts to get fuller, the voltage will start to drop off a little bit. Now. As this gets fuller and the voltage starts to drop off across the capacitor, the voltage here starts to go up. And at some point, the voltage on the base leg will be great enough to turn on the transistor or start to turn it on, which means energy can now flow this way and start to light the LED. And as it fills up more, the voltage gets higher here and it starts to conduct even more and even more and the LED becomes brighter and brighter. So this is how we get our time delay. So. I'll show you that by sticking a voltmeter in the circuit. If I put the voltmeter here, and I measure the voltage across there, at the moment, press play, you'd expect to see we've got one millivolt, which is a thousandth of a volt, nothing. If I click this, rising 1.5, 1.2, 2, around 2 volts, there's enough voltage or current flowing into the transistor base to switch it on, so current flows through into the LED. You'll notice the capacitor is still charging. Um, this is worth watching. Um, just because it, it says something about how capacitors fill up. They, um, they fill up quickly at first, and then as they start to get fuller, the voltage across them starts to drop off. Um, what will happen is this will keep filling up, and the voltage will keep going up, but it will never quite get towards 9 volts. All right? It's basically impossible to totally fill a capacitor. Um, instead, you can get near. Uh, if you were to plot a graph of it, it would be a linear curve that would start tailing off and trail off into infinity. It'd be like an exponential graph. So anyway, there we go. Now, obviously, when I turn this switch off, there's no longer any power getting to the LED. Instead, the LED draws its power from the capacitor. So the capacitor now empties into the base of the transistor, which gets directed to the LED. Uh, to a point where as it's emptying, eventually the bolt voltage drops off and eventually shuts off power to the transistor. So if we do that, voltage drops, ping, turned off, still draining, and it stops. Now what you'll notice is it doesn't actually totally empty. You can see it's slowing right down. For this reason, the second time you turn this circuit on, the bulb comes on a lot quicker. Alright, I'll just show you that again. If I start over, um, here we go. First time I activate it, to about three and a half seconds empty it second time I turn it on one two it comes on a lot quicker that's because the capacitor can't fully empty because of the transistor shutting off the supply to the LED and the LED was the thing draining it I am talking a lot about this circuit anyway this is a basic time delay circuit this is the same input as you'll see on the 555 timer circuit uh, which I've done another video on now, there's two things you can do to increase the length of that time delay that it takes that LED to come on. The first one is you can make a bigger bucket. You can put a bigger capacitor in. So if you were to make that 2000 UF, it should take twice as long to fill up. I'll just do that again. Okay. Yeah, getting on about six seconds. All right, as you'd expect. Uh, second thing you could do is control how quickly uh, or how much current can go in or voltage can go into filling up this capacitor. So if you were, the only way you can do that is with this thing called a resistor. If you were to double the size of this resistor, that would make it take longer to fill up. So think of this as water again. Think of this as the hose pipe supplying water. This is like a fat bloke stood on the hose pipe. This is the bucket. If it's a skinny bloke stood on the hose pipe, there'll be less pressure on the hose pipe. The water will fill the bucket up quicker. If some massive fat man stands on the hose pipe, it's going to really restrict the flow of water 
and the capacitor will take longer to fill or the bucket would take longer to fill. So think of the resistor in here like a fat man on the hose pipe and think of this as a bucket and you've got kind of the right idea. All right, so that's um, that's capacitors and resistors used together to make a time delay. Just to show you something else, if I was to remove the resistor completely, um, this capacitor will charge up almost straight away. Okay, you'll see what I mean. If I stop, press play, bing. All right, because there's no resistance in front of it, it fills up almost straight away. In reality, it would take a bit of time, um, not the speed of light or speed of electricity, but it still takes time nonetheless. So generally, you find them used as a pair, capacitor and resistors. Whenever you see that, by the way, sometimes they like to call that a capacitor-resistor network in the exam, um, because it's a network made up of a resistor and a capacitor. Now that leads us on nicely to the maths. Um, I know you all love a bit of maths. Me, I hate maths. Um, it's basically been the bane of my life. Now, um, we've talked about that. They take time to fill up. That causes a time delay. You can increase it with a resistor, yada yada. Now there is an easy formula here for working out the time delay of a capacitor and a resistor network. It's this. You get given this in the exam paper, you don't need to memorize it. The time in seconds is the value of the capacitor times the value of the resistor. That's easy, however, you're going to have some problems here. You need to convert K and the U into their base units. Now, I don't want to spend this video talking about this topic. Standard form and uh, indices is a whole topic on itself. There is a video on my channel about standard form if you need some help with it and there's probably some much better videos or information in maths textbooks but basically these letters K that little mu U symbol they stand for something and it's just a way that engineers and scientists came up with of writing very large or very small numbers without having to write so many zeros all right it's basically a lazy thing so if you don't take account of that K and that U in the calculation you'll get the wrong time delay so I'll, I'll talk you through the maths here so here's our formula. T is C times R. So we've got a thousand UFs, whatever that means, times 10K ohms. Ohms is the measurement of resistor. Now we need to convert that. Um, if you look up standard form, you'll see that U, which stands for micro, it's in micrometer, microwave, um, means that number times 10 to the minus 6. If you don't know what that means, I'm sorry, you'll have to look up the maths or go look up my other video. Um, if you see a K, most of you will be more familiar with this. This means a thousand, and that's what times 10 to the 3 means. It means add on three decimal places, three, or move the decimal point three places to the right, give another three zeros. So basically, we've got, if we convert those two numbers, um, there should be a little button on your calculator that says EXP or times 10 to the X. You can punch that in, and your calculator will do the maths. But either way, this maths is basically the same as doing that number times that number. Bonkers, I know. Why didn't they just write 0 0.001 times 10,000? That's what they actually mean. Um, do the crunching on that, the number crunching, and you'll get that. A 10 second time delay. Easy. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, in the exam, uh, they give you the formula, which is nice. They give you all the formula in AQA's paper, but they don't give you what U and K and all the others, nano, pico, milli, micro, kilo, giga, tera, um, what all of those things stand for. You just need to go and learn them from the chart and memorize them. Okay, uh, there we go. So you can work out time delays like so. That's that. Right, second thing that capacitors can do before I shut up is uh, smoothing power. So I've explained it here. You get, um, in often in electronics we come along high power components like motors. Uh, other things sometimes like speakers and relays are also very high power. They consume a lot of current and this can often cause problems with components, particularly with components like PIC chips or microcontrollers. Because these chips are like miniature computers, they need a really good power supply without any um, dips in the power, otherwise they tend to freak out a bit and their programs will reset. So we can, uh, we can use capacitors to help with that. Um, I'll, it's probably easier to explain by showing you a picture here. So this is a Genie PIC chip. This is like a standard microcontroller we use in school. Um, it's being powered. 
and attached to one of its outputs I've got a transistor turning on a motor. Now if you're in year 10 you won't have come across PIC chips yet until the end, uh, year 11 you should have done. What a PIC chip is like, it's like a mini computer. This is a chip that we can write software for, instructions in code, and we can make it do things based on what we've written in software. Now the problem is, because it's like a computer, just like your desktop PC or your laptop, if you turn the power off uh, while you're working on something, whatever it is you're working on will go, it'll disappear, because you've basically restarted the software. The same happens on these things. If they get a power cut, wherever they were in their program, their complex sequence of events, they'll reboot, they'll, re they'll restart. Now, this phenomenon happens with motors. Because motors, um, if you've ever ridden a bicycle, whenever you start to pedal it's always really hard to get going that first few pedal strokes when you're up to speed it's a lot easier so you need a lot more power to get going than when you're at speed motors are the same when they're at rest they need a massive kind of push of current uh, to get them going now because of that thing called ohm's law which we've learned about in the past v equals ir if something consumes a lot of current um, and the resistance is constant then the voltage is also going to fluctuate as well this is what happens in the circuit. So our PIC chip sends an instruction out of this leg to turn on the transistor as part of its program. Transistor turns on, opens up a path to the motor. The motor basically screams, give me all you got. And all the current in the circuit temporarily, f well not all of it, but most of it flows to the motor because the motor needs it to get going. And what happens is the voltage drops because all the current's gone to the motor. The PIC chip gets a little drop in its voltage and quite often it causes it to restart its program and reboot and then what happens is the PIC chip goes oh I'm at the start of the program again I better turn the motor on because that's what I'm supposed to do the motor starts up causes a power cut the PIC chip restarts again turns the motor on the motor restarts causes a power cut you get the idea and it happens on a loop and the end result is you build your lovely PIC chip circuit you plug your motor into it every time you turn the motor on you get this weird sort of jittering spazzing around freaking out action and your program doesn't do what you expected so this is where we use capacitors to help us now remember I told you capacitors are like uh, little batteries they they store charge um, what we do um, is we put capacitors around the components that either cause the power issues or are affected by it if we put a capacitor around the motor here what happens is as soon as you power up the circuit that capacitor fills up and it acts like a little reservoir, like a kind of emergency power supply. Same here, the one around the power rails of the PIC chip also fills up and it acts like a little power supply. So when we turn our motor on and the motor goes, give me all you've got, yes it drains the current, but it's got this tiny little extra booster pack here. And any dipping off is kind of compensated by that. If that's not enough, um, and you're still losing power to the PIC chip, then the PIC chip's got its own little capacitor across it to help booster its, uh, its current and keep the voltage at the right level. So this is kind of common practice in a lot of electronics on high current devices and in any kind of any place where you've got power supplies and you're likely to get um, disruption on the power because of motors and other such things, you would tend to put capacitors around them uh, to, to solve the problem. Okay. Right, and uh, other components that, that cause this same issue, uh, relays are bad, relays, if you remember what they are, there's another video on this if, you, if you're not dead already from watching this one from boredom. Um, relays have a coil in them, which is a coil of wire to make a magnetic field, that also draws a lot of current. Sometimes speakers have the same issue, more often than not though it's motors. Alright, so that's that. To wrap it up then, they do those two jobs, they create a time delay, by the fact they take time to fill up, they store charge. Um, time delay is useful for various things in circuits and more importantly we can use them for smoothing fluctuating voltages or smoothing a power supply. All right, Remember they're measured in farads, two different types, electrolytic non-polarized and there we go. And if you're doing the maths there's your formula and take care of those little symbols, they mean something. If you crunch the numbers you'll get the wrong result. Right. I do apologise to everyone, that video is 24 minutes, I'm getting worse at this, my videos are getting longer, I am rambling, I think it's a sign I'm getting old. Anyway, uh, tune in next time for more 
uninteresting videos about electronics.